Welcome to Is This Good, the show where we boldly, conclusively, and scientifically decide what things in this big wide world are good. I'm Matt Austin, and with me as always is production powerhouse Jason Doyle. Hello! Hi, JD. And a man that's been in your ear talking sports, food, fashion, and politics. You've heard him on Count the Dings, Full Court Fits, and the Ringer NBA show. He's a hooper, he's a sneakerhead, but most importantly, he's a cat daddy. His ID says <laughs> Wozni Lambre, but you know him by six letters. Big Woz. <laughs> Woz, welcome to Is This Good? Ah, uh, thank you, man. That's that's a hell of an introduction. That's it. That's amazing. <laughs> and shouts to Mimi. She's she's actually sleeping right now. But shouts <laughs> to Mimi. I am a cat daddy. Uh, Mimi the cat usually sleeps through most of your podcast appearances. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so where are we finding you? Are you out in LA? I'm in Los Angeles. Yes, I am. I've been here for over five years now. I moved in September of 2017, and um, yeah, been here since. Okay, but you're originally a New York guy, right? I'm a New York City native, yes. Born and raised in New York. I, I lived in Pennsylvania for two years for college, um, and then I moved back to New York. So before I moved in 2017, I'd never lived anywhere besides Brooklyn and Queens in my life. Going okay? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. LA is, LA is dope. I think um, as a 35-year-old man, it's really suited to my needs um, you know, uh, as far as like, way what less. are your needs was, <laughs> well, good weather. That's okay. For one. Like, yeah, that's I don't want to have to shovel my car out of a goddamn driveway <laughs> in the winter, uh, with no gloves, um, that, uh, just as a certain ease of, of life. Like there's just a comfortability that comes with living here. It's just generally easy to live. And, you know, I'm I, I moved here at 30, so I was already a fully formed man and human being. Um, <laughs> I don't know that finding yourself in Los Angeles is necessarily the best thing for people to do. Um, and maybe I'm saying that as a biased East Coast native, but I'm happy I came here already knowing who I was, and so I could just do that um, and not try to find new friends, new hobbies, new ways of being right like i didn't have to do any of that stuff here i could just come do what i do uh be with my people um spend time with people that i care about and, and just live my life yeah same as you was i moved to i'm also in la i moved here when nice. i was older and i uh was a fully formed man knew who i was didn't need new <laughs> friends yet at the same time why do i find myself charging my crystals when it's a full moon you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i don't I, man i find the most la thing about me now is that like yeah i want to wear like a coat when it's 50 degrees out and, <laughs> and stuff like that but yeah i'm not drinking celery juice um i haven't picked up veganism um i i've still never done a sound bath so yeah no i i haven't done all of the la things but i do enjoy being here well thank you for coming to our sound bath um <laughs> we're, we're gonna get to that in a second it's it's just the sound of my voice it's not really relaxing but before we start quick bit of housekeeping if you have topics for a future show email us at is this good pod at gmail.com follow us on instagram and tiktok at is this good pod Subscribe on YouTube and review us on Apple Podcasts. And remember to please tell a friend or family member about the show. Why? Because I asked politely. <laughs> so, Waz, the premise of the show is very simple. I'm going to give you a topic. You're going to tell me if it's good, and we're going to talk about it. Does that sound all right? Yeah. All right, here we go. First topic. Joe S. and Gene E. both, asked, uh, both wrote in to ask, surprise parties, are they good? And something we didn't get to in the intro was, obviously everyone knows you for talking basketball, um, fashion on full court fits, a little politics on count the dings. But one thing I noticed when I looked you up on Instagram is you're also a, a party planner. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> me, my cousin, and a few of my friends, they all, they all work within the music industry, like work for okay. record labels, right? Um, have like creative jobs in the creative industries and all of us are from New York. We're certain we're used to like when we hang out um, socially, like a certain vibe and a feel to, to being social that just didn't exist out here. And so we decided that we wanted to throw 
the kind of parties that we would like to be at. So it sounds like you are a party expert. So to get back to the question, <laughs> I, I kind of am, honestly. <laughs> so, so do do any of the you know does is it possible to make a surprise party a good party? Is it an advisable yeah. thing to do? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I I and I'll say this, and people are going to think I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, like. I would never encourage somebody to throw me a surprise party mm. because I'm somebody who's in the practice of throwing my own parties for myself, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody would ever need, like generally what happens with a surprise party is somebody doesn't feel like, or they're too down, or they feel like they're old now and they shouldn't celebrate or whatever, and they don't want to do that. And so somebody who's close to them steps in and says, you know what? I'm going to do the party on my own and not let this person's sourness around the party um, throw it off. Or like the surprise party I went to uh, last summer, it's an engagement slash surprise party. You know, the engagement where they invite actual family mm -hmm. members and close people to be there to experience it with them. And so like there's actual good uses like me personally. I'm going to throw myself a birthday party every year because I just look at it as an excuse for people to come out and be together. Like, I'm going to take it upon myself to bring people together so we can have a good time. Nobody's going to need to convince me to do this. It's not really like, oh, let's lift Waz up. He's such a great person. It's like, you know, that's besides the point. It's like, we're adults. A lot of times people have kids, people have this. A birthday is just a good excuse for people like, yo, go find a sitter. Hey, take off that next day at work. Do this. We're going to tell you in advance. You got no choice. Show up to this gathering place and let's do this. And I think a surprise party done well can achieve all of those things. Yeah, I mean, I, I see the thing is you're saying, look, I, I am going to throw a party for myself. I understand what it means to plan a party. But I think everyone in their own way is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Like. The, the guest list, the people that they want there, or the kind of place where they would want to be, or the kind of food or drinks they would want served, or the kind of music they would want played. Everyone has their preferences, but yet when you get a surprise party thrown for you, you, you get none of your preferences. You get yeah. someone else's preferences. And what about fr from the attendee side? I find that attending a surprise party oh, it's the is worst. a lot of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, it's, the worst. it's like, it starts at seven. First of all, I guarantee you it does not start at seven. Yeah. The person is going to show up at eight, but they're That's telling you seven time. so that yeah. yeah, it's a dummy time. And then you're like, well, I don't want to get there when they're walking in. So you got to be super early. And there's no <laughs> lamer scene than a surprise party before the person gets there. It's just people like, like not sure what to do because at any moment you could be interrupted by the person coming. So it's just like a lot of quiet chatter with, you know, the lights dimmed. Um, so then, and then once the person gets there, it's hard, or I don't know, I find it hard to like swing that party back into motion because it's just the person going, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. You guys are All here. valid points. And another thing that I find about surprise parties is it's usually a significant other throwing it. Mm -hmm. And I find there's an awkward tension there because if, a lot of times it can feel like the significant other is making the party about them. And the fact yeah. that they are throwing it and I'm doing this great mm. act for my partner, blah, blah, blah. And that sort of ego can get in the way of making the party what it needs to be. But yeah, all of those things um, sort of matter for sure. But I think the payoff of somebody being like, wow, like all of these people showed up for me on my birthday or my anniversary or whatever the hell it was. Uh, that, that I feel like the payoff can usually be worth it if you get like just the the, the basics right, like decent music, decent food, you know, people that the person actually likes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you get that right, I think it's gonna be a good a good party. Yeah, yeah. Here's a life hack for you: if you don't like your your partner's friends, throw a surprise party for them because then you can just invite your own friends and people you like and you don't have to have their friends there. Uh, JD, <laughs> um, I'm going to guess that you're not a fan of surprise parties, but have you ever had one thrown for you? Yeah, you were at it. It was for my 40th birthday. Oh, remember? yes. And, uh, and yes, you're right. Every fiber of my being wants to say surprise parties, not good because of all the reasons you guys just uh, said. 
And my wife organized it, as it was, as you said, your significant other. And she invited everybody under the sun. Like, there were, you know, my extended family was there, and then my university friends. And it wasn't, like, at a house in the middle of town. It was at a farmhouse in the middle of northern Ontario, and everybody made the trek there. And I was legit surprised. I knew something was going on, obviously. But the amount of people there... Uh, I was truly touched, A, and B, it was a fucking blast. Like, it was awesome. And, you know, there is that sort of requisite, I got to say hi to everybody in this party. And I think there was, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but there was at least 100 people there, it felt wow. like. like I, there, did, I did not remember that, but. that. was There was so many people there. It was it was in November. It was outside in this, oh far, this field. Oh, my Lord. Outside and in, in Canada in November. Yep, yep. We had this huge bonfire. We were singing American Pie a cappella next to the fire. <laughs> J.E. Skeets barfing in the woods. It was crazy. It was so fun. Was so, this is this is our culture. This is our culture. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And and you know what? You know what's important because when I mention the significant other, I can think to a time when my friend was sort of seeing this girl, um, and she was a girl that. So it's my friend who I had went to high school with. He went to college. He moved away. And then he had finally moved back, right, to New York and, you know, was working or whatever. And he is, was sort of reuniting with our friend group. And a girl that we introduced him to, they had started, whatever, dating or whatever it was. And this is relevant because it wasn't, they weren't seeing each other that long. And I'll never forget the phone call where she called me and was like, I'm, so I'm thinking about throwing a surprise party for such and such. I'm like, this is a horrible idea. Like, why, <laughs> like, why do you think y y you should take it upon yourself to throw this man a surprise party? Like, why do you presume to know who should be there, what it should be like? No, And, and you know, quickly I realized she was trying to enlist me into this job. And I was just like, no. No, it's not going to happen. But when your wife is doing it, you know, somebody who knows you quite deeply and intimately and knows who you would want to see there, this is when you get successful surprise party. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, ultimately, I'm going to say not good on this topic. <laughs> I, I was, I was, I've been a, had a surprise party thrown for me once. I definitely didn't like it. If I had wow. known, like, I would have worn something different. I wouldn't have had that second piece of tiramisu <laughs> and felt like shit walking into the surprise party. Um, I didn't enjoy the first sentence of every conversation being someone coming out and being like, "Were you surprised?" <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I was surprised. Really, you were? Yeah, yeah, I was. So we, we got you, huh? Yeah, you got me. <laughs> Oh, man, you should have seen your face. Yeah, I'm sure. It was crazy. <laughs> oh, okay. And as, as an attendee, I already said, stresses me out. Got to get there too early or else I'm freaked out that I'm going to show up mm -hmm. at the same time. I also don't want, like, a week's worth of reminder emails all with the subject line, shh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with instructions like, hey, don't. Don't park on the street. Don't park on the street. Park <laughs> seven streets away. He knows your license plate. No one knows my license plate. I don't even know my license plate. Oh, uh, so, goodness. Waz, I think you're ultimately you're good on this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's good. I think surprise okay. parties are good. I, I always like, you know, JD mentioned how touched he was. I always, that's my favorite part is like people seeing people that they really care about just coming out for them to celebrate them. Okay, and JD, it seems like you're a surprising good. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprising myself by saying it's good, but yeah, I'm going. I'm landing on good for surprise parties. Okay, well, was before the show, we poll people on Twitter just to see where they're at, and 60 percent of people say surprise parties are. What do you think the people said? Good or not good? Not good. That's correct. 60% of people yeah. say not good. Yeah. All right. Next topic. At Toby T 93 asks, third wheeling with a couple, is this good? So, of course, this is referring to, let's say you have a couple friend. Let's say you're single. You go out to dinner with them. You're seated at a table for four, but alas, one chair is empty <laughs> because you are alone and you are the third wheel. So, was third wheeling with a couple, is it good? So many things come into play. Like, it depends on the couple, one. Like, if you, these are two people who you really have a deep connection with, 
it's completely fine. But two, I would say have other plans, right? Like make that third wheel dinner the first stop of okay. something else that you're doing. Because there's nothing sadder than, all right, time to go home. And you catch your <laughs> lonely ass Uber by yourself and you're going back to watch, you know, um, Seinfeld reruns in your apartment all alone. Like have other plans. So because and this is the thing, too. This is why I think it's important, because oftentimes, you know, your friends who are in relationships, you end up spending a lot less time with them. Right. Because one people work all the time and their free time, like it's hard for them to find time to just do things together. So they're doing less group activities than your single friends would normally be doing. And so you got to make sure you're making time to hang out with your friends that are couples and often couples. They like they don't want to just hang out with other couples like they need to know what it's like in the world of <laughs> The living, you know. That's what right. I mean? They want to. They want to talk about like well, what's been going on on yeah, Tinder. It was, yeah, and exactly. And so live you, vicariously. Yes, you need to do that for your friends. But anytime you're doing it, please have other plans. I think it's like calling it third wheel. Like the idea is that the third wheel is superfluous, like not needed. Which is, I don't know. I guess people have never heard of a wheelbarrow, but or a tricycle. Um, Come on, or now. a tricycle. Yeah, Come exactly. A wheelbarrow is one wheel. It's a great point. It's a great point. It's a great point. But I think that people think that the couple doesn't want you there. Mm. I say you're wrong. The couple does want you there. Mm. Because like Waz was saying, they get to hear about excitement from the single world. But also they get to perform a good relationship for you. Like they're constantly like together. So let's say they're living together or they're going out to eat together or they're in the car alone together. They need a little energy from the outside to titillate them and to spark new conversation, but also for them to be like, Hey, we're going to be nice to each other tonight. We're going to make each other laugh. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be the good couple, um, that makes this other person comfortable and have fun time. So I think actually it's a real, everyone wins. Here's a caveat when it comes to fifth wheeling. So there's two couples plus you, that's a no brain. You got to get out of there because then you're just intruding on a couple's night. Mm. Um, but JD, you've been married for a while. Do you like having a third wheel out with you? Yeah, of course. Uh, everything you just said is true. Although I do sort of, I'm a little offended at the idea that I need outside titillation. Oh, you need it, JD. You're bored. <laughs> you're bored and boring. I don't think I'm bored actually, but uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I uh, uh, a single person with us as a couple, and I would even say uh, if if you're fifth wheeling, that's just a group of friends going out, right? Like yeah. that's I would no, no, because a group of friends is a is five people that aren't necessarily mostly together, I guess. like as couples. Again, I mean, but it depends on your level of comfortability with everybody, right? Like it's one thing when you're again your homie. Male or f or female just got with somebody that can be kind of like oh it's this whole feeling out process. Once you're actually friends, legitimately with all the parties involved, it doesn't have to feel that way. But like yeah, if two of my homies just started you know seeing two women and it's like oh we're gonna do this dinner, can you? I would probably be like I'm good, <laughs> you know I'm I'm good on that. Because uh, it's just, you know, it becomes this like, you know, you're asking about their job. They're asking you about your job and this and you're back. And it's that whole feeling out process mm. instead of just being like, oh, let's talk about, you know, Kevin McCarthy getting flogged um, <laughs> publicly in the Congress. Right. How about that 14th vote? Whoa. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think there's something to uh, what JD said there as far as uh, making it a. Uh, a friendship thing and and yeah and also i think the third wheel stuff i think it doesn't emanate out of the couples being like oh we're with our lonely loser friend who's, been, <laughs> who's just such a loser doesn't have a significant other i think a lot of people just feel self-conscious about not having somebody and so they don't want to be around people who are happy in their relationships and doing that um and and if you you know if you're fine with being single and you love your friends then it's fine to do this third and fifth wheeling
if I'm given the choice between two couples and a, and a, having a fifth person, I would much rather have the fifth person because yeah, I easily. hate the double, the two couple dynamic. Like mm. two couples going <laughs> so out nasty. for dinner, it's like I feel, especially here in the south. Sometimes I feel like a lot of pressure for me to just talk to the to the man at some point. You know, <laughs> interesting. What I mean? and, and I'm like, eh, kind of <laughs> let's just all talk together. You know what I mean? Like, and, uh, and you don't and you don't know shit about college football, so that there's no topics of conversation you can discuss. That's right. I I haven't had a real job in literally 20 years. Like, <laughs> so it's really hard for me to talk to people. Uh, so you know, I like to talk to a group as a whole, not just like singling off with the sexes. I mean, I, I, I'll so, throw down what, above Real Housewives. I don't care, you know? What What I find is that couples love talking about themselves. Mm. Meaning, like, how did we meet? What, what's our couple, like, sort of dynamic? And, you know, how do we plan this? And blah, 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 blah. And, oh, he's so good at this <laughs> and this and that. And they <laughs> love to talk about the dynamics of their relationship. So, being inquisitive about that, and it's and it's also a good way to watch them go at it because it's like, no, but I thought it was, and, 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 and you know, the back and yeah. forth. It's good. Always ask couples about couples. <laughs> uh, okay, well, so fifty four percent of people say third wheeling with a couple is. What do you think? Good. They said not good. Really? Wow. They said not good. They're yeah. too proud. And I will say, as you get older, if you're not comfortable and you're single and you're not comfortable third wheeling, you are going to be lonely and you're going to limit your social options. So go out with the couple, talk to the person that you are more friends with in the couple. No, sorry. Talk to the person that you don't know in the couple and make fun of the person that you do know mm. the best in the couple. <laughs> really gang up on them. That is a fun dynamic. All right. Next question. Hayden W asks, sneaking snacks into a movie theater. Is this good, Waz? Do you go to the can pharmacy first? A, you go to Popeyes, Walgreens first. Can we consider a Popeye's three-piece meal a snack? Because yes, I know people who have done that before. <laughs> now, where are you putting a three-piece Popeye's dinner? A woman has to have a bag. She has to have a purse. Okay. Absolutely. Because yeah, as a dude, you're just looking crazy. So she's mewling in your Popeye's. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, 100%. <laughs> like a broke-down palace style. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I, I've legitimately never done this before. Okay. Um, really? and not that wow. I not that I think that it's bad or good. I've never done it. I just spend the twelve dollars or whatever it is on sweet tarts and just keep it moving. I don't even <laughs> give it a second. I just figure I'm getting price gouged anyway with the popcorn and the seven dollar bottle of water. Um that's only twelve ounces and all of that stuff. Uh but I, I think it's good to get some get back, like the uh, between the parking, the ticket itself. The beverages, the popcorn, the butter. Uh, we're getting hosed here yeah. as far as the markup. So I'm, I'm not against this. JD, what do you think? Are you a sneaker? Oh, 100% a sneaker. Although, respect to Waz because uh, that's how the theaters make their money. You know, it's not, they're not making much off of the actual box office. They're, they're, they're making money through the concession stand. So, and, and I've, I've happily been gouged before because I, there's nothing quite like hot buttered popcorn and throwing in the M and M's, you know, and that's like twenty five bucks right there. But uh, but you know, some, I will bring in my own M and M's. I will bring in. Uh, I brought in like a six pack of beer once to a movie theater, uh, <laughs> and uh, I learned that one from my dad. Uh, and that's uh, and family and it, is so important. Awesome. <laughs> family is very important. Uh, so I'm yeah, I'm totally in on it. Uh, one thing though, take all your shit with you. I hate people just mm. leaving shit just all over the place. Just leave the trash the there? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's such yeah. a pigsty after the movie's up. You're so totally. right about that. And I get that there are people there to clean it up, and that's their job and stuff. But come on. We don't, uh, have some respect for ourselves in our, in our environment. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to be Stephen Miller throwing paper on the ground and telling the janitor to pick it up. That's right. Um, <laughs> is, that, is, that is a story I heard about him. Um does it change it now, JD, that you can literally get any food at the theater? Like there's usually a bar mm. at the theater. You could get pizza. You could get a hot dog. I mean, if you go to the Alamo Draft House, you could get like a club sandwich and a salad. So yeah. does that does that change things for you? Uh, I do not like those places, like the movie tavern. I don't like waiters and waitresses yes, coming up to I you. Yes, I agree. I, do not like it. It just encourages more chit chat. Mm -hmm. I will say, <laughs> however, and not to go all Pulp Fiction on you, but – I went to the theater in – I went and saw Avatar in London on Boxing Day. 
Mm-hmm. That's the day after Christmas was. And uh, <laughs> I had a glass of beer from the pub, like that's the bar at in the theater, in my seat. A glass of beer. It was awesome. That I loved. But for some reason, I hate it in America. I don't know what I don't know what it is. It just encourages talking and stuff. First, first of all, that's bold of you to drink a pint of beer during a no. three and a half hour movie. I had two. And it was during, it was Avatar, which is in the water. That's what I'm saying. Did you, <laughs> did you, how many times did you pee during I, that? I, I, I did pee once. I okay. had to. Okay, had thank to. you. Um, so I'm going to say, I, I'm going to actually ruin this now and say 91% of people said sneaking snacks into a movie theater is good. Wow. 91% of people. That's the biggest landslide yeah. of the day for sure. But to me, buying food there is part of the experience. That's part of going to the movies. If you just want to stay home and eat your own snacks and not deal with parking and not st- pay the high cost of a movie ticket, then that's fine. But if you're going, go all out. Yeah. Because I'm still scarred from being a kid and having my mother force me to take <laughs> air-popped popcorn from home Ooh. into the movie theater. Air-popped, yeah. JD. Oh, air-popped. Wow. wow. Air-popped. The best, that's the best incredible. we're doing is sprinkling a little kosher salt on there. And there's no flavor on that thing. <laughs> and it, yeah, it's partly from thriftiness, but it's also from like, oh, this is healthier. And also my mom tries to convince me it's better. You don't want that popcorn with all that salt and that butter on it. That's not what you want. I'm like, uh, actually, that is precisely <laughs> God what I bless, want. God bless your mom. And um, another thing that I'll add to this about the movie theater experience is that it's one of those industries where everybody who works at the movie theater is generally young and I just enjoy watching young people get beat up by adulthood. <laughs> just the, the misery of every single young person that works at the movie theater. And this is, I'm just like, yes, you're getting a preview of the misery that is, that is adulthood. This youth thing is fleeting. It's almost <laughs> over, guys. <laughs> I love watching young people work. It's fun. <laughs> I love it. All right, Waz, let's get to one more. Uh, at Sam Lake Eggs asks, ordering a Bloody Mary after brunch hours. Is this good? So Bloody Mary, you know, along with the mimosa, probably the most classic brunch yeah. cocktail you can get. Yeah. But some people are out there ordering it at five, six, seven, eight <laughs> at night. What do you think? Is that good? So Bloody Marys is one of those things that I just I just don't understand. Um, I just don't want to drink tomato juice with rum or vodka or whatever in it and celery to suck on. I don't like I don't understand the Bloody Mary. And so I don't want a Bloody Mary at all. It's it's another one of those things like tartare. I've had it in Europe. I've had it over here. I've had it at a nice place. I've had it at a decent place. Every time I've had it, I'm just like, no, not for me. Can't do it. And it's one of those things where it's just like, I, I will never be grown enough, grown up enough <laughs> to enjoy this thing. And so Bloody Marys are another one of those things I don't understand. It's food in a drink mm-hmm. form. And also, I don't like chicken and waffles. Like, don't pour maple syrup on my fried chicken. Like, it's just certain things like that just shouldn't be like my alcoholic beverage shouldn't be a food. You know, it should be this savory grub. And so I just don't, I can't get with the Bloody Mary. So it's bad any time of day for me. Well, one thing I will agree with you on is we've gone too far with the Bloody Marys in general. Like the ones that come and there's like every man. It's like a huge contraption. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) And those little things that look like swords, and they've got shrimp and candied bacon and no, cheese. No, like no, no. bacon, come on! No, nah, there should be a You're wedge dunking of lemon. bacon into your scotch or whatever it is mixed with the bloody. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's usually a vodka or or a bloody Maria would be a tequila. tequila but mm. um, really, a celery, a lemon wedge, uh, a cornichon, and an olive. <laughs> cornichon That's is it. like pickles, right? Yeah, so it's a cute okay. little tiny little pickle. Gotcha. Um, JD, what do you think about this one? You Bloody know. Mary's after brunch. You know what I think. Uh, At, okay. It is unacceptable. After 5 p.m., you <laughs> cannot order a savory drink. Full stop, that's the end of it. You just can't do it. I love a Bloody Caesar or Bloody Mary. Uh, first thing first thing to eat in the morning or drink in the morning it's awesome, especially if you're hungover. I would add one ingredient, Matt, to your list that you just made. 
a little bit of horseradish. Nice. Yeah, but that's spicy in the horse. drink. That's in the yeah, drink. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So the guard, you're okay, yeah. Uh, but it is awesome. I love it. And uh, also the sweet and savory thing uh, was you mentioned chicken and waffles. I'm fine with it. You know, I, I like I like the sweet with the savory. I'm not. I don't have a sweet tooth, so I gotta have some salt or something with my mm, sweet. But you gotcha. said you're a sweet tarts man, so yeah, I would I, never. I, I, I love. I'm yeah, I do have a sweet tooth, an extreme one, but it's like for me it's it's a separation of church and state. It's like <laughs> I'm gonna have the waffle, I'm gonna have the pancake, yeah. and then on the side the eggs and bakey. Yeah. Okay. You know, or maybe I will get some some chicken or whatever, but I just don't understand pouring honey and maple syrup on my fried chicken. I need <laughs> come on now, I need some hot sauce on that thing. Like yeah, that's man. that's just how it goes for me. All right, so should you order a Bloody Mary after brunch? Waz has gone galaxy brain and said you should never order a Bloody Mary. <laughs> yeah, I just don't. I just uh, don't. JD's saying not good. I'm also saying not good. And 61% of people agree with us. They say ordering a Bloody Mary after brunch is not good. Don't put, don't put your bartenders through that. Uh, all right, Waz. One last quick thing to do here. I know you're tight on time. Um, and that's subjective trivia. <laughs> Subjective trivia, it's just like regular trivia, except only I know the answer. So, Waz, I'm going to ask you a question, and I have the answer written on this card, so you know I'm mm-hmm. not cheating. We're going to see if your answer matches my answer. going to take you back to the movie theater. Aside from popcorn, what is the best snack to get at the movies? You can consult with JD. You could talk it out. Aside from popcorn, I know what see, mine is. But I'm going to assume... Oh, he's getting into my head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I know what mine is. I'm not going to presume to say that you're with me. I'm going to say that you're on the regular people side of things. <laughs> uh, it's like, hurtful, not a but continue. No, I'm just crazy about what I'll eat in there. Um, I'm going to go with Milk Duds. Oh. I'm going to go with Milk Duds. Okay. Interesting. Okay. But I kind of... Hmm, I want to know what you're... You want to know what genuine mine is? answer is? Yeah, oh, I mine, genuine mine is um those um those sour worms. Yeah, okay. give me that. Okay. The, yeah, yeah. the okay. sour worms is getting consumed. I'm just gonna kill like a huge amount of them throughout the entire movie. I might even have. I might even swap out like no popcorn and just go straight candy worm. on it. Yeah, just wow. worms, gummy wow. bears, all of that stuff. It's it's happening. Go full Dune, just worms. Exactly. Uh, All right, JD, uh, let me hear your answer quickly. Wow. Uh, You know what? I honestly don't know because I've seen you throw down like uh, a sweet, like a Swedish fish Mm -hmm. and a sour, sour Mm -hmm. patch kid. But I've also, uh, I think you like chocolate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say like uh, Junior Mints. Mm. No. That's the correct answer. Wow. Wow. I love it when I get it right. Very Junior good, JD. Mints. Was if it makes you feel any better, I didn't have sour worms as my second choice, but oh, I had sour Junior patch kids mints. as the second choice. I've never bought this anywhere, but I do see them at every single movie stand for sure. Oh, you gotta try. They're, great. they're they're good because you got the salty from the popcorn, you got the sweet from the, mm, the chocolate, gotcha. and also that peppermint in the middle kind of soothes your mouth of that salty <laughs> flavor because that t- the tiny cup of water you got you know ran out at uh, at the end of previews. Um, Waz, you killed it. Thanks so much for coming on. Where can people find you? Um, I would say just go to the ringer.com, you know, my general NBA coverage, uh, that's full court fits. That's, um, weekends with Waz, that's ringer NBA show, the group chat with Justin Verrier and Rob Mahoney. And then I do a little, you know, a little politics podcast called woke bros with my man, Nando Vila. Where um, the woke, we're not actually woke. We were just being <laughs> ironic with the name, but like, whatever. We're thinking about changing the name because like people, the <laughs> joke just goes over people's heads and it's just like, yeah. Anyway, check out Woke Bros wherever you get your podcast. We try to do, <laughs> we try to cover the issues that affect normal, everyday, working class people. People that got to work for a living, they got to pay for child care, they got to pay for babysitters, they got to pay for health care, they got to pay for the stuff that really makes our lives go. Um, that's the kind of things that we're interested in on our show. I mean, ain't going to be a lot of canceling, ain't going to be a lot of, you know, 
<laughs> Ain't gonna be a lot of Twitter <laughs> on our show. Uh, I'll just say that. But to make fun of that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, check that out if you care about it. Uh, all right, Waz. Thanks so much for coming on. Everyone else, stay tuned. When we come back, JD's gonna test me on some is this good questions inspired by his European vacation. Ue la bibliothèque? <laughs> We're gonna find out. All right, welcome back. JD, on the last episode of Is This Good, we learned that you canceled Christmas and took your wife and two kids to Europe. You hit up London, you hit up Paris, you hit up Amsterdam, and you came back with amazing memories, beautiful pictures, and God bless you, a list of things you encountered that may or may not be good. I know you've been stewing over them like a fine beef bourguignon you got in one of your fancy French bistrots. So serve them up, JD. I'm ready for them. Yeah, it was a great trip. Uh, as you said, Amsterdam, then London, then Paris. There was a train strike, so that threw a wrench Ooh. into things. Uh, it was bad, but we got to hit most of what we wanted to hit. Including in Paris, the Louvre. Oh, now I've heard of it. Yeah, have you? It's a it's a little museum. It's all uh, in that tiny pyramid. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, I love the Louvre personally. Uh, I've been there. It was my fourth time there. Okay. And you know, it is probably the most popular attraction in Paris, and Paris itself is an attraction. Mm -hmm. It took us over an hour to get into it. Um, waiting in line outside wait, or just, yeah, okay. Just waiting in line, trying to get in. And we had reservations. Uh, anyway, when we got in, Rachel, we had our kids with us. Uh, we had visited the catacombs that morning, Ooh. and which was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and then we uh, we got in. We had one o'clock reservations. We didn't get in until like 2.15-ish, I want to say. So it took a long time to get in. And then she had a checklist of things that she wanted to show the kids. Okay. And she knew they were running out of gas. Top of the list was Mona Lisa. There was also Winged Victory and Liberal Liberty Leading the People. Also, she calls it Tits Out for Freedom. <laughs> but the Mona Lisa. Uh-huh. We were blowing by major pieces of artwork. I mm -hmm. mean, and I've been, I've, again, fourth time to the Louvre, fourth time in the room. For, with first the, time for the kids. You, first I time imagine. for the kids, yeah. yeah. So it was important for her that that they get to see the Mona Lisa. And I was like, they're not even going to get to see it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the Mona Lisa, did you know that Da Vinci invented a technique for breaststrokes that leaves no lines? That's yeah, can... I learned that in Knives Out that's right. Glass Onion. <laughs> That's right. I'm quoting Glass oh, Onion. Quoting Glass I'm quoting onion. it. Is she sad? Is she happy? Is it something else? This simple thing that you thought you were looking at, it suddenly takes on layers and depth so complex, it gives you vertigo. Yeah, that's Edward Norton's speech about the Mona Lisa. I have no idea. I've never actually been up close. I've seen pictures of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, I can't tell if it's good. So I'm asking you, Matt. Is the Mona Lisa good? You're almost asking me two questions. Is the Mona Lisa as a painting in and of itself a good painting? Yes. And then you're also sort of asking me the experience of seeing the Mona Lisa. Is that good? Okay. Because well, yeah. I imagine when you went, like, how, how many rows deep of people were there in front of it? Uh, there were, I want to say, 200 people waiting. They, they 200 had 200 people? I would say that's they, double the amount at your 40th birthday party. It it was a bigger line to get into France than the customs line to it, to see the Mona Lisa. Like it, right. they've 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 uh, they've installed. This is new since the last time I was there ten years ago. They've added like a bank style snake, you know, thing that you go around. I guess so that you can get close to it and have a glimpse of it and. There's probably fights breaking out to get close to the Mona Lisa because it's a por it's portrait sized. So yeah. I've never actually seen it up close. You know, uh, Rachel sort of took the kids along the side of it and tried to take pictures to the side. She got some pictures of it, and that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Taking pictures of famous art. What? Why would you do that, anyways? But I, I mean. There were so many people waiting. There was no way I was going to stand there and wait. And most of them were just taking like you know, selfies of you know mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, it's, the they're, just say, they're just saying I was here. The same way they would Fine. take a selfie at the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, it's because the Mona Lisa is a symbol for both Paris. I would say it's yes. a symbol for Renaissance art. Mm -hmm. It's short. It's basically shorthand. It's like 
I saw the Mona Lisa. I saw art. I experienced right. culture. Right. In the same way, it's like if you watch uh, like a documentary about the 60s, like they're going to show a scene of Woodstock. And that's just shorthand for like, oh, people were getting down and <laughs> breaking their parents' rules in the 60s. Right. Um, but, you know, if you're asking me about the experience of seeing it, it sucks. Right. I mean, in a sense, I would rather see a very good band in a club when I'm like two feet from the stage, then see a great band and I'm sitting in the back row of the stadium. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Actually. I agree with that. Um, so I'm not interested in seeing, I have been to the Louvre once. I mean, it was like, I can't believe it, but like already two decades ago. Right. And I'll put it this way. If you lined up like a bunch of, um, let's say I'm an alien mm -hmm. and I have never seen painting before. And you lined up like 30 paintings. I certainly would not pick, the Mona Lisa yeah. out as like the standout thing. Um, and, and from what I've heard, the Mona Lisa's actually ballooned in popularity in the early 1900s because it was stolen yes. and it like captured the, the national imagination. But like, if you look at um, the last supper, now yeah. that's a painting. Who? Same guy, right? S same guy. <laughs> he was <laughs> same guy <laughs> when he wasn't, you know, busy figuring out that smile or, or designing helicopters or cutting open human bodies to draw their insides. He was painting the last supper too. Yeah. Yeah. Banger. That's a banger. And in the Louvre itself, you know, the coronation of Napoleon is two rooms over and that is an incredible painting. It's basically life size. It's one of the biggest paintings I've ever seen. I mean, I was there for that and you could actually go up to that one and you could actually read the description and, you know, and we did see Liberty leading the people, which was great as well. The Raft of Medusa, anything Mariner-like, like a, a mm -hmm. nautical disaster from mm -hmm. the 1700s. I'm very into that. The Mona Lisa is, ah, it's just lost on me somehow. And I feel like yeah. a troglodyte for saying that, but. No, uh, I, I, I agree with you because look, we're not art, art experts. And like, how much can we appreciate her legendary smile? Like, you know, it's just like, you know who has a legendary smile? Julia Roberts. She really does. She really does. Lights up a room. <laughs> Lights up a room. Uh, but basically, like, your experience to go to see the Mona Lisa was, like, everyone standing, uh, waiting in line outside the, the famous restaurant that's in every guidebook that's kind of mid because it's for tourists. Right. And, uh, and you walk right past that line and you duck into the locals only, like, cool spot with, yeah. like, uh, uh, more authentic food. Exactly. Um, so I mean, I'm saying, I'm saying not good. I mean, you could come for me. I like art. Every, I, I just saw a lot of art. Maybe what was it like six weeks ago over Thanksgiving was went to a couple museums on a trip up to Western mass. I don't know what I'm looking at, I, yeah. but Mona Lisa, I'm sorry. You don't, you don't excite me. <laughs> It's a, I, I'm I'm with you. I didn't take any Twitter polls for these, so I don't know. I guess we'll find out what the people say. Let us know in the comments below. Okay, so when we were in the uh, the Louvre, they had audio guides uh -huh. that were Nintendo DSs, repurposed nin actual Nintendo DSs. It sounds like the audio guides were <laughs> part of the art. <laughs> Probably, maybe that was maybe that was a statement, and, and I think they had like uh, we didn't get one because I think you had to pay extra, and I wasn't staying in another lineup. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they had maps on the bottom screen of them. Anyways, uh, I thought that was pretty cool. But we went to a bunch of uh, museums, and we only got the audio guides that were included in the price, okay. like the at the Winston Churchill War, War Rooms and the catacombs in Paris. You kind of need it for that. Uh, but we didn't really get them anywhere else. And I was just curious, Matt, mm -hmm. are audio guides good? This is one where I will say they are good, but yeah. I very often don't do it. I find when I'm traveling alone, I'm more likely to yeah. because you're just on your own time and, and you have more time and, and maybe patience to stand in front of a painting and listen to some guy with a British accent, always a British accent, <laughs> um, tell you about it. But I find that, I don't know, these days being in a museum is more about, and I hate to say this, vibes. It's like, <laughs> I just want to be in this quiet space in yeah. what's usually an architecturally beautiful building. It's calm, it's peaceful. And 
<laughs> this is embarrassing, but my reaction when I walk up to a painting, like I said, I was at a couple museums like six weeks ago, is I walk up to the painting and in my head, there is a very loud voice and it just goes, reveal yourself. <laughs> what is, what is good? Why? Why is this one and not that one? And I, I will stare at it and try to like figure it out. Now the audio guide could be helping me. I, what I will do is I'll read the little plate next to yes. it. Um, and that will help me. But I, if, but if I can't sort of with the, the context of the, of the text on the plate and my own feelings and trying to appreciate it, I, I, I think that's, that's enough. That's all I have to give. I, I, I don't know, like an audio guide is too much living by someone else's rules. Right. See this in this order and wait. Ultimately, I don't like them. When you're on your own and you don't have the audio guide, sometimes you can sidle up to a guy who's like giving a real live tour right. and over here and be like, yeah. oh, that's why they call it Starry Night because <laughs> the, it's the stars at night. Yeah. Oh, oh. The, <laughs> the lily pads were outside his house right. and that's why he was painting them. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm going to say not good and especially because what I noticed they're doing now is they're saying, hey, download the museum app on your phone right. and that's an audio guide. Yeah. But guess how many people have headphones? Especially, God bless them, our older <laughs> friend, our older listeners. So I saw a guy at the Norman Rockwell Museum straight up pressing it, cranking the volume oh, up, God. putting it to his ear, and all I could hear was his audio guide, yeah. thereby ruining my vibes. Yeah. So I'm going to ultimately say not good. Uh, was Is it just a, a thing of cost for you? Or if they were free, did you would you want to always have one? Well, I, it's, I'm with you in that if it's for art, don't bother. Like, that's not how the artist wanted you to see the painting or the sculpture or whatever it is. It's the title, right? The, the title and what I'm looking at is all I need, right? Mm -hmm. I don't need... I don't need to know that he, the lily pads were outside of his window. I'm just looking at the art. But for something historical, like the catacombs, it was definitely interesting. Or the war rooms, the Winston Churchill war rooms, because half of those rooms are literally just bedrooms that were that were stored closets before. So it was good. The only thing I would say is, and I regret not doing this because it was very expensive, but I, I wish I had done it for at least one of the attractions that we went to was high. You can hire pro, like a private guide mm -hmm. and that we usually get you into whatever the, uh, the museum or whatever it is. Uh, and that, that's what I ended up doing at the Winston Churchill rooms because the, there's a, in the middle of the museum, there's an actual museum about his life. And I just sort of glommed on to this couple who were, who was getting a private tour with from the, a guy who was just taking them around and showing them. And, and he was a fountain of information and you, they were asking him questions. I was just eavesdropping on it. And it was, it was fascinating. So, I mean, it's like 200 bucks or whatever for a couple of hours, but uh, that would have been cool. But I also know that if I had gotten that, the kids would have been like rolling their eyes mm -hmm. and like not listening to him and be like, I spent, 200 bucks on this guys like can you at least listen i was like we'll we're on vacation we don't want to learn about this so so yeah i'm gonna audio guides i'm gonna say good for historical things not good for art work all right next one as you know matt i'm in, mm -hmm. i'm from canada you're yes. from canada correct french is the a, a, an official language an official Canada. language an Throughout actual Canada. official it's not it's actually on par with english that's right i do not speak french i'm from toronto you are you are an anglophone from quebec yes, yes? is that fair to say yes but you speak french i do speak french not as well as i used to i was never fluent 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 but much closer then than i was now i've been gone since i was basically 18 so haven't spoken a lot of French, but I do understand it and I do speak a bit. Right. And also being a, a Canadian, I try to be polite. Uh, I always have it in my head that is, if I try to speak the language of the land that I am in, it'll mm. be a sign of respect. Mm, you'll right? be embraced. But ultimately, they'll let me off the hook if they speak English, right? right. If I try and then mm. I'm not going to get, you know, whatever. Like, I'm not going to feel bad about it. But the truth is that... 
almost always when I tried to speak French in Paris, they would cut me off immediately and responded mm-hmm. in English, which yes, was they embarrassing. Were, they were disgusted by your French. <laughs> That's right. I think so. And obviously they see me coming a mile away. I'm wearing like a puffy <laughs> jacket. I'm obviously a tourist. Uh, but I don't know. I guess the question here is, is speaking the language terribly good? Yes, it is. It's absolutely good. Okay. I think it's good for you to try to sort of extend yourself and yes. figure out how to say a couple things. I think it's good for the people to see you're making an effort. Like you said, they will switch back to English in most of Europe, like 95% of the time. Yeah. Um, but I am going to add a caveat. And this might be controversial. I'm actually curious to see what people say okay. or not. Don't yeah. comment. It's not enough to just speak the language, even terribly. You have to use the accent. Yes. Because now, part of you is going to say, ah, that feels inauthentic. I feel like I'm either making fun of it or, or it's sort of culturally insensitive. No, it's going to help you. <laughs> um, I realized this in for when I went to China. Yeah. And I was flying into Shanghai, and I had to fly somewhere else in the morning. So I thought, okay, I don't know where I am. I'm just going to get a hotel by the airport, go back to the airport in the morning, get the connecting flight. So I was really in the middle of nowhere. And I saw there was – I sort of walked down the street. I see there's a restaurant, very rural. I walk in. They give me the menu. It's all in Chinese. No pictures in it. Sorry, in Mandarin, I should say. Right. And I had read – I remembered reading the in the in my dictionary on the way over that – Eggplant was Chedza. Okay. Okay. And I was like, okay, that f- I feel pretty safe for my like first meal in China. Like, I know it's not going to be insane. So the waitress comes and she asks me what I assume is, what do you want? And uh, I'm very proud of myself and I say, Chedza. And she's okay. like, Chedza? I'm like, Chedza. She's like, Chedza. I'm like, Chedza. Anyways, this goes back and forth. She's getting very frustrated. Right. With me. Finally, she grabs my wrist and I'm like, I'm going to get kicked out of this <laughs> restaurant. She drags me to the kitchen, gestures to everything on wow. the counter, and it's just like, what do you want? And I yeah. see the eggplant, and I point to the eggplant, and she goes, oh, chidza. You know, or I forget right. exactly the tonality on it. Yeah, yeah. But like, and then I was like, okay, it's not enough to say the word. I got to say it in the voice. Right. So I find found like when I was in Italy, it's no use to be like, mi scusi uh, right. dovo e treno <laughs> per Firenze. yeah you have to pretend you're Italian yeah. and you have to go mi scusi <laughs> dove e treno per Firenze <laughs> now is that correct like grammatically or whatever no but I guarantee you they will actually understand you better yes if you if you put on the accent right Right. I agree. It's it when you're when I'm in France, I feel like I'm making fun of the French when I'm going, mm, bonjour, you know, like <laughs> yeah. you take on this. Blah, 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 blah. But that's how that's how they speak. That's how they talk. That's their fault. Well, hold on a second, because that's how they talk in English when they come over here. The French people, they have what? a French accent speaking uh, English. Stupid American. Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. You can't say that that's not easy to understand. If a French person is calling you a stupid American, <laughs> even with that accent. Uh, you know what it is, yeah. But I think, yeah, you're right. You just gotta, you gotta, you gotta find a, a not even a word, but like a tone that you will say to yourself before you say the sentence. Yes. So in in France, you're right. It's like a, uh, <laughs> you gotta loosen your lips. <laughs> uh, alors, qu'est-ce qu'on fait ici? A priori, like you know, like you gotta in trouble your for lips. this one. <laughs> but why? But that's how they talk. You're right. A, you're you, right. I mean. Phonetically, you have to make those sounds. You got to loosen your lips. Yeah, yeah. you know, in in yeah. Italy, it's more like I guess what what would the sound be? It would be more like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> no, no, that, that's that's Yiddish. More of a, hey, hey, hey. this is more of a, hey, scusi. <laughs> <laughs> your your voice goes up an octave at least when you're speaking. Yeah, well, that's that's I don't know. I don't know. That's how you got to do it. I'm telling you, yeah. in my experience, it is easier to understand. The downside is, you will then when you're when you're speaking English to whoever you're with on the trip and you're in Italy, you will start speaking English in that voice. It is almost <laughs> impossible to stop. It's not making fun of them. It is a tribute. Still, you shouldn't do that, but you should. 
speak the foreign language, even if terribly, and you should try to do it in that accent to make yourself more understood. Agreed. Was it a fun trip? Did you did did we settle on that? Would oh, you go? It was, a, it was awesome. It was okay, what would number one city? No, oh, it was Paris. Paris, for Paris. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I love them all, and I've been I've been to uh, all three cities multiple times. I used to live in London. We ended up staying in a, the uh, two blocks from where I used to live, so that was kind of a trip to be there like thirty years later, uh, and it was it was incredible. And uh, you know, the train strike was an absolute nightmare, and it will fuel it. Like it will it caused a travel story that I will never get over, but well, we're not going to talk about it today. <laughs> uh, okay. What a tease. What a tease. Speaking of being in London, I do have one caveat. One thing you don't need to do as a Canadian or as American, you don't need to put on a British accent. <laughs> right. They will understand you. You don't need to start being like, in it, in it, bruv. You don't need to do that. Just speak regular English. Yeah. And they will respect you more. <laughs> uh, if you have topics, tweet them to me at StartersMad or email us at isthisgoodpod at gmail.com. Remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Big Waz for coming on. JD, I'm glad you're back. I'm glad I'm back. For everyone, I'm Matt Austin, and this was good. We'll see you next week. Bye.